There's a lot that happens within our family before this event, so let me explain. My mom's brother, who for the sake of this story I'll call Clark, has been married to this woman for over 20 years now, and they have one child together. Growing up, I've always been told that my aunt was a little off, and I was instructed by my mother to stay clear of her if I ever had the chance. She seemed pretty normal to me until I was around 10 years old, and she started harassing my mother and my grandparents. She would hit on my grandfather and show up to their house unannounced, and would occasionally try to start fights with them. We had to block her on all of our phones, and my uncle was told that she's no longer allowed on ours or our grandparents' property. Years had gone by without much issue towards us, but for the past few years, she has been mentally abusing my uncle along with my cousin, and once in a fit of rage, she actually peed on the floor in front of my cousin. Yes, full-on squatted and relieved herself. My cousin has since moved out. With all the background information out of the way, let's get to the actual story. It was Christmas Eve about a year ago, and as for tradition, we were having dinner at my grandparents' house. It was my grandparents, mom, dad, brother, uncle, cousin, and their dog, Holly. We're at the dinner table, which is in view of the front porch windows, when we hear the doorbell ring furiously and the door being pounded on. As we looked over at the windows, who do we see? Her. My uncle gets up and goes outside to talk to her. From the table, we can hear a bit of yelling and my uncle opens the door to come back in when all of a sudden she grabs the dog and then threatens to take it away if my uncle didn't give her the money that she wanted. At this point, my parents are outside watching all of this along with a few neighbors. My uncle gets in the car with her and before she gets in to drive, she then yells, What the hell are you looking at? I know I'm beautiful, and God loves me. Then she gets in the car and speeds off. So we're all at the windows, just stunned and absolutely confused, all the while my cousin is texting his father to make sure he's okay. He lets us know that he is and that he was going to an ATM to get her some money so that they would leave her alone. About an hour or so later, my uncle gets back with the dog and tells us that she was basically holding him hostage because he didn't give her enough money. But finally, with a bit of bribing, she brought him back, and I haven't seen her since. The rest of the night obviously had a lot of tension, and I watched the road behind us all the way home, scared that she was following us. Since the incident, things have escalated at their house. We have found out that she's doing drugs and has been cheating on my uncle for a while now. For those asking why we didn't call the cops, he told us not to. I don't really know why, but he hasn't really done much about her, except tell her that he wants a divorce, but nothing's come of that. So, to my really crazy aunt who's pretty much threatened my entire family, please, let's not ever, ever meet again. I attended what was expected to be a super fun party ringing in 2015 at a close friend's home. I expected to be awake until dawn, so I made sure to eat a really big dinner and arrived late to the party around 11pm with two of my best friends. We were a pretty tight-knit social group and despite the party being a combination house show with several bands playing, I knew virtually all of the 60 or so people who were already there when I arrived. Among friends and acquaintances, everyone was celebrating, drinking, and generally having a really great time. I had planned to meet up with some other friends at around 2am when they were done bartending a public event, so I was drinking socially but in moderation. I'm no stranger to the sauce, and I have a healthy tolerance. By midnight, the party had grown to at least a hundred people, and by this time there were people drifting in from neighboring parties and the surrounding university area, despite attempts to limit attendees to people we actually knew. 
I opened my third beer at around 1am and continued taking photos, snaps, and messaging other friends who were not there. Around 1.30am, I started to feel really drunk and thinking that perhaps I was just overwhelmed by the constant activity all around me. I stepped into the mostly empty living room for a breather and to message my friend. I sent her a message inviting her to the party as we had planned on meeting up. As I finished my message, I felt someone come up behind me. He then pressed his body against me as he gripped my hip. As I straightened up, I could feel him bending down slightly to whisper into my ear. But it wasn't a whisper. He then clearly said to me, In a few minutes, you aren't going to remember a single thing. And then, I'm going to rape the hell out of you. I froze. It hit me. I wasn't feeling really drunk. The confusion I had attributed to social anxiety or the large crowd, I was experiencing because I had been drugged. I knew I had only moments to prevent the inevitable. I ran from him best I could and didn't turn around. I went and retrieved my purse and jacket and started calling the two people that I meant to meet up with at 2am. I was so out of it that I was having a hard time communicating what was happening. I started crying and moving throughout the house, trying to find someone that I could explain it to. I was way too disoriented. Thankfully, friend number one was able to leave from bartending early and came to get me. He called me as I ran outside, and the creepy guy literally chased me. I got to my friend's car and as I started to black out, he said the creepy guy was trying to wave him down, shouting to him that he was my friend and was going to take me home. Friend number one told me that I just kept saying, drive, drive, over and over again. And he took me home where we met up with friend number two, who was bartending the event. At 2.30am, I lost consciousness and remained unconscious for five and a half hours. They were shaking me, trying to get some kind of reaction. Nothing. I didn't respond in any way. They sat up with me throughout the night to make sure I was okay. Around 7am, I somehow managed to get up and climb into my bed. At 9am, I awoke and I had no idea where I was. I was so relieved to discover that I was safely at home. I think I was high for a total of 20 hours and I didn't really feel normal again for several days. I don't think I'll ever know who drugged me and I only have a vague description to work from. I'm really fortunate and very grateful to have my friends. Be careful out there. When I was 13, the dawning of a new millennium took place on New Year's Eve. While people were fearing for the worse with the Y2K bug or out partying and drinking, I was home alone. In 1996, my parents had split up and from there they divorced and my mother and I moved across the country from Oregon to Tennessee with her best friend. On the eve of the year 2000, I was home alone and my mother was currently out of state. Now, this really didn't worry me as this wasn't the first time. I often came home to find a note on the kitchen counter saying that they had gone to Florida for a few days and that there were groceries in the fridge. Since the divorce, she was regularly leaving me alone for really long periods of time to go to Florida. We lived on a relatively quiet road surrounded by trees and set a few miles out of town. And I knew most of the people, if not by name, then by face, enough to wave and small chat with, and had never before been given a reason to be afraid of being alone. On the night in question, I was staying up late watching television. I had most of the lights on in the house. Not because I was afraid, but because at 13 I wasn't really concerned with the electricity bills or saving the environment. I felt completely safe and protected within my little bubble of home. As I was watching the movie, I kept hearing these weird noises outside, but I remember thinking it was probably just the neighbors. 
Though they weren't extremely close, a couple of them were having a party slash had people over for the holiday. About halfway into the movie, however, the power in the house suddenly went dead. I sat on the couch for a minute, just sort of in a panic daze, because it was near midnight and pitch black. I remember thinking that the power must have gone out and that it would just come back on, so I just decided to sit on the couch with my blanket and just wait. A few minutes passed by when I heard a noise in the kitchen, where the back door is. My heart started racing in my chest, because I thought it sounded like the back door being shut. The back door sits just off in the dining room, which is connected to the kitchen, which leads directly into the living room, where I was currently sitting on the couch. A few seconds passed after I had heard the sound, and I was straining my ears to pick up anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Every noise suddenly felt magnified. When footsteps sounded on the floor, I immediately slithered off the couch onto all fours, crawled around the ottoman, and started as slowly and as quietly as I could make my way toward the space between the love seat and the couch. I knew I could fit under the side table and be completely hidden by the dark and the ottoman from playing hide and go seek in the dark many many times with my friends during sleepovers. I was nearly there when the footsteps became more apparent. I knew from the sound of them that whoever it was was making their way through the kitchen, now toward the living room where I was. They weren't hurried or anything, it was like they were just moving around in the kitchen. I then glanced up from where I was crouched on the floor, and to my horror, there was a dark silhouette standing in the archway between the two rooms. To my credit, I didn't scream, however, I did panic. I stood immediately to my feet from my hiding spot and ran down the hallway. And I believe the only reason I wasn't overcome was because the person chasing me had to get around the ottoman in the dark to follow me. I did what all children do when they're afraid, and I bypassed the front door, the guest room, the bathroom, and ran to the farthest door down the hallway. My room. In all honesty, I probably wouldn't have been able to get the front door unlocked and open in time, as it was right off to the side of the couch. When I was 10, I got a bird for my birthday. He was a blue-fronted Amazon, and I named him Boo because it was October and close to Halloween. Boo had a large iron cage. It was kept in my room. This information will become relevant later in the story. As I ran into the room, I slammed the door shut and then locked it. However, the lock was simply one of those little turn knobs that you can easily pop with a butter knife. I had barely gotten the door shut and locked when the person on the other side knocked on it. I have no idea why they knocked. If they did it to mock me or to scare me, but I knew in my heart that my little lock was not going to keep whoever it was on the other side out of my room. It didn't keep my mother out when we were arguing, and it wouldn't stand up to brute force. I was panicking, on the verge of tears, when the person started laughing. It was low, quiet. It wasn't like manic laughter, but as if they were genuinely amused. It was the laughter that really frightened me, and I started heavily, hysterically crying and looking around my room trying to figure out what the hell I could do. That was when I realized Boo's cage would fit almost perfectly between the door and the wall of my closet. The cage moved quietly on my carpeted floor, but as I pushed it into place, it scraped against the door and alerted whoever it was on the other side that I was trying to barricade myself in, because suddenly they then threw themselves at my door, and you could hear the sound of the wood splintering and the door handle being twisted so violently. Boo, who had been stirred by the movement awake, began literally screaming and flapping his wings. I might have even screamed with him, but honestly, I don't really remember screaming. I just remember being extremely terrified. Terrified, I crawled under my bed and waited. Several minutes passed and the person eventually stopped attacking my door. Boo continued screaming even after he had stopped. Though being under my bed gave me no feeling of being secure, I didn't come out from under it because I simply had nowhere else to go. 
I thought about trying to go out the window, but I was afraid he might expect it and therefore be waiting for me on the other side. And it was also several feet off the ground, as the house was built on a raised foundation. I remember laying under my bed, just terrified, for what felt like hours. I must have fallen asleep because I awoke in the next morning to daylight. The fear of what happened came back to me as soon as I registered where I was and why, and scared that whoever had been in my house might still be there. I then decided to crawl out the window and run to a neighbor since it was daylight outside, and therefore, I felt less afraid. Crawling out a window is a lot harder than it looks, and I did it less than gracefully, as I was not, and still am not, the most coordinated human being. Once I was back on my feet, however, I carefully made my way around the house, and that's when I noticed the back door was wide open. Still pretty scared, but feeling braver now that I was outside and that it was morning instead of pitch black night, I walked up the back steps and peered inside. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, I decided to go back inside. Looking back now, I really cringe on how stupid this could have turned out, and I really wish that I could have told my younger self to make the smarter move and just go get help. But thankfully, no one was inside the house. I did a terrifying, heart-pounding room-to-room -room check, looking in closets and under the beds, even behind the couch, anywhere that I thought even a small child might be able to fit. I even popped the lock on my mom's bedroom so that I could check it, and then relocked it afterwards. When I was absolutely positive there was no one there, I then went back to lock the back door and noticed that the breaker box on the opposite wall was also open. The main switch had been pulled. I flipped it back on, locked both locks on the back door, checked all the windows and front door, and then called my mom, where I once again broke down crying hysterically. She called a coworker who came and stayed the entire day with me as they drove back. My mom still took random trips to Florida after that, but I always went with her from then on forward. So terrifying, laughing, crazy person that broke into my house on New Year's Eve. Please, don't ever come back. I sincerely hope no other young girl had to meet you either. I don't really know if you were just some drunk visitor of a neighbor, but you terrorized me that night. I was really afraid of being alone when my mom was working, and to this day, I still get scared when I am home alone. I overthink what I would do if someone came inside and where I would hide. Whenever my cats make a noise out of nowhere, I immediately investigate for fear it's someone trying to get in. I'm really glad I survived that night. I was five years old and my mom was going into labor with my younger brother. I stayed at my grandparents while my folks were at the hospital. I shared the queen bed with my grandfather who was sound asleep snoring. At some point late in the night, I was awoken by the bed shaking quite vigorously. It continued for like 5 minutes, but who really knows, maybe it was just 30 seconds. I tried to shake my grandfather awake while calling for him to wake up. He eventually woke up very groggily, but he had no clue when I asked him what was happening. He quickly fell back to sleep, but I was very frightened and still awake. I was now sat up in the bed, sitting in diffused moonlight. All was still and silent. I got up, wanting to look at the Christmas tree. Christmas trees always brought me comfort, and that's what I craved after such a fright. From the foot of the bed, you could look out of the room through the short hallway and into the front room and picture window, maybe 25 or 30 feet away. They had a mid-century aluminum Christmas tree in front of that window. Not because retro was cool, but it was literally the same tree that they used since the 50s. As I looked out to that tree without lights at 3am, the tree along with some presents sat quietly. Only filtered bluish streetlight gently filled the room with weak illumination. However, there was something that was different now. Sitting next to the aluminum tree, 
was a pair of two huge black Doberman pinchers, sitting silent and still, just staring straight at me. Well, my grandparents didn't have any pets. I jumped back into bed and threw the covers right over me. I eventually fell asleep and woke up to the morning sunshine making the aluminum tree warmly shimmer. I think about what happened that night from time to time. It's the first paranormal encounter I've ever had. At that point in my life, I don't think I even had a concept of ghosts or the paranormal. Was it really just simply a five-year-old with limited understanding of the world and an unlimited imagination? Or was there something paranormal shaking that bed and presenting those enormous dogs? I guess I'll never know, but I will always wonder. So this happened in the 90s in Miami during the Christmas holiday break when I was about seven or eight years old. Tiny bit of personal backstory. My great-grandmother's second husband ended up abusing his grandkids, who happened to be my aunts and my father, for over a decade. But it was never discovered or spoken about until after he had passed away, about the same time that I was born. So thankfully, I never met him. But as we all know, that kind of abuse can seriously alter your view of the world around you. In this case, it made my family very hyper-vigilant about protecting me, and I wasn't allowed to be outside alone or sleep at anyone's house ever. Now that that's out of the way, on to the actual story. Since I was born, my grandmother had always lived with us. Before I was school-aged, I stayed home with her during the day, and once I began school, she would watch me whenever we had summer or holiday breaks. I loved her. She was a southern red-haired firecracker who took no crap from anyone, but had the biggest soft spot for me. So this winter break, I had just gotten new rollerblades and was going up and down the paved walkway practicing. My grandma was on the porch reading and watching me, and then the house phone rang. She debated having me come inside while she went to answer it. I pleaded to stay though, as I was finally getting the hang of it. She reluctantly agreed and went inside to answer it, but she left the main door open so that she could still see me through the screen door. It took a few minutes for her to return, but during that time, nothing happened, so I think she was more at ease. She returned to her book and now I was working on learning a few tricks. After maybe another half hour or so, she said it was time for lunch and that we had to go inside. I absolutely begged her to let me play just a little bit longer, and promised when she finished preparing lunch I would come inside no questions asked. She stood there watching me for a bit but then agreed and again went inside, leaving the screen door wide open, and she told me to sing while I skated so that she could hear me. Moments later, maybe two or three, a white van came down the street, very slowly. They seemed lost, but I didn't really pay it much mind because I was just a kid. I was unaware of the evils of the world. Plus, I was on the other side of the chain link fence, so, in my head, I was considered safe. Even when it rolled up and stopped right in front of the house, I kept on skating. It wasn't until the passenger door opened and an extremely tall man stepped out and asked me which way was the highway that I began to get nervous. I held out the gate for stability and pointed in the direction. He tried to make some small chat that I can't really recall, but it was along the lines of, how was my Christmas, what did Santa bring me, etc. And then he asked if I wanted to have the toys that his daughter didn't want. I was still silent because now I was scared. The way he looked at me, it was dark. He was smiling, but his eyes, they seemed both joyful and vicious at the same time. It still unnerves me to this day. He slowly came closer to the gate and then asked if I wanted to go check out the toy. This is exactly what they taught about stranger danger in school and home, so I shook my head and began to skate backwards towards the door, not wanting to take my eyes off of him, but also not wanting to yell or run because I didn't want to be rude if he really was just a nice guy after all. He then came closer to the point where he was only a few feet away from the gate 
and asked if my parents were home. Now all the thoughts of politeness vanished and I panicked. I yelled for my grandma and tried to run inside, which landed me promptly on my back and I smacked the back of my head against the concrete. At the exact same moment, he unlatched the gate to come inside and before he could get to me, my grandma came bursting through the door with a cast iron skillet in her hand and cursing at him. He looks up and sees her and then bolts. He hopped back in the van and before the door could close properly, the driver was speeding down the street. My grandma then bypassed me completely and ran after the van, now screaming at them. She picked me up and carried me inside and then called the police and my dad while she asked me what happened. Ten minutes later, I'm with the paramedics and getting my scraped elbows all patched up while my grandma spoke with the police. My dad showed up soon after and I didn't go outside for the rest of that break. Years later in my late teens, it came up one Christmas in conversation and I got more of the story. Turns out my grandma was on edge a little bit more than normal because there had been a man who broke into a woman's apartment and she had actually been assaulted right before Christmas and the man was still on the loose. The description that my grandma and I both gave the police actually matched the man to a T. Bald spot, bright blue eyes, and well over six feet tall. We don't really know if they ever caught him or them since I'm sure whoever was driving the van was 100% down with whatever evil plan that man had for me. But thank God for my grandma. I really do believe that she saved my life that day. A bit of backstory before I begin. This happened in 2007 in upstate New York on Christmas night, around 8.30 p.m. The day was pleasant and festive, opening presents early in the morning with my sisters, hearty breakfast made by dad, delicious smells from the kitchen as mom and dad prepared a feast, visits from extended family bringing pies and cakes for dessert. Around two, we all sat down to eat and then lazed about for the rest of the afternoon into the evening. At about 8, after everyone had left and the food was all put away for round 2 the following day, I decided to head over to visit my friend in the next village. The drive would be about 10 minutes if I took the back roads to get there, so I did. First, a little background on where my friend lived. It was a housing development surrounding a private lake. You might call it a gated community. You could still drive through it freely after hours by entering one of four private entry points. Since the community was built around the lake, the road surrounding it went in a spiral sort of shape. The houses were sparsely positioned on the outermost part of the spiral road, closest to the four private entry points. As you drove in further, there were a lot more houses positioned closer together near the lake. My friend lived on the outer edge of this development, so once I reached the entry point, it would only take me another few minutes until I reached the house. His house, along with all the others, were far enough apart that you couldn't see them from the road as you were driving by. There were woods on either side of them with long driveways and open fields. You could see porch lights in the distance, but that was about it. As I entered into the development, the speed limit dropped from 30 miles per hour down to 20. There were no street lights in the development, and for some reason, I never put my high beams on. I couldn't go any faster than the speed limit because there were speed bumps in every, like, 30 feet or so. It was a mild night. I remember having my driver's side window open slightly, taking in some fresh air. I remember driving in silence, which was unusual for me. I normally always listen to music when driving. I must have been enjoying the quietness after the commotion of the day. I reached a section of the road that had barren fields on either side and wood set to the back. Houses were probably nestled back into the trees. As I drove, I noticed what looked like someone walking up ahead on the opposite side of the road, coming in my direction. Mind you, I was still going about 20 miles per hour the whole time, so it was probably less than a minute by the time the walker came into clear view. I got a quick scan of it from my windshield before my car and it was exactly parallel. This is what I saw. It was not a person. It stood on two long legs, with long arms hanging down from its shoulders. It was strong looking, lean, muscular, 
but not beefy in stature. It looked thin at the same time. It stood at least seven feet tall. It was light colored. I'm not sure whether it was white, tan, yellow, or grayish. It didn't appear to have fur, but there was some texture to the skin. It wasn't smooth. There appeared to be something coming down off of its back. I don't know what it was. All I can recall about its face is the small features it had, but the mouth and jaw were notably large. It had pointed things atop its head. Two things going straight upward with something mingled between the two things. That's what I got from a quick scan, and from my observation of it, as it neared my car and as my car neared it. As my car became parallel to it within a split second, I went from looking out my windshield to looking at it from my driver's side window. At that moment, its face quickly peered down at me, and all I remember was the mouth open wide. Out came a remarkable scream that I'll never forget. It gives me chills just thinking about it. It consisted of a high-pitched shrill shriek enveloped by a deep guttural growl. Both sounds happened simultaneously in that scream. I kept driving all the while. This was all happening so fast that I didn't even have a chance to be scared or shocked or anything. I continued driving and continued past my friend's house and drove home. I called him to tell him what happened and I just needed to get back. I was probably running on adrenaline to get home. Later on, I was in total shock after it sunk in. Had my driver's side window been opened fully, it would have touched me, or worse, taken me. I'm certain of it. To this day, I still haven't worked out what this was. Has anyone else ever seen anything like this? Personally, the last half of 2017 has been pretty exhausting for me. The most draining part, both emotionally, physically, and financially, has been the laborious task of moving my father into an aged care facility due to his rapidly advancing dementia. He lives in Tasmania, where I grew up. I'm currently living and working in Brisbane, which is about 2,500 kilometers to the north of Tasmania. I've been making the three and a half hour flight down to Tasmania about twice a month to sort out my dad's situation. I've been busying myself by fixing up his empty dilapidated home in order to get it ready to be sold. I moved out all of his furniture and belongings, save for a pile of blankets and pillows that I turn into a makeshift bed on the floor while I'm in visiting. The house is situated in a semi-rural area, surrounded by overgrown trees and bushes. It's an old house. It's damp, everything creaks, and there's currently no electricity, which makes the night very creepy. The house itself is not very secure. No alarm system. The doors do have locks, but a forceful nudge will pop the door right open. I flew in on Christmas Eve in the late evening, picked up my hire car to make the hour-long drive down to the house. I stopped in at a friend's place who lives about 10 minutes away from my dad's place to have a few beers and shoot the crap about the year that had just passed. After a couple of hours, I realized that I had probably surpassed the legal blood alcohol limit to drive. My friend's legendary wife dropped me off at my dad's and offered to come back in the morning to pick me up and go back to their place to get my car. A true Christmas miracle. I entered my dad's house around midnight. Inside the house was pitch black, and in my slightly drunk state, I flipped the light switch, and nothing happened. Oh yeah, that's right, no power. Using my phone as a light to navigate my way through the house over the creaky floorboards, I noticed that some of the tools that I'd left laying around inside the house had been stolen. I sighed and accepted the fact that it was my own stupid fault for leaving them out in an unsecure house. Some kids probably noticed that no one is living there and took advantage of the situation. It was unsettling knowing that someone had been in here, but I didn't bother calling the police over a hammer, wrench, and screwdriver that came to a grand total of about $16.50. So I wasn't too concerned about it. The good news was the big toolbox which I kept locked up in the laundry cupboard that houses my more expensive power tools was still there and intact. 
I studied the padlock and the space around it, and it looked pretty scratched up and dented, like someone had crudely attempted to pry it open. <laughs> nice try, idiots. I said out loud to myself. The toolbox is very big and heavy. Way too big for one person to carry it. That is, unless you're Andre the Giant. Exhausted, I went into one of the furnitureless bedrooms and made my makeshift bed out of the blankets and pillows. I couldn't get comfortable, and it was taking me a while to drift off to sleep. As I was laying there, the only sounds that I could hear over the ringing of my tinnitus was the gentle rustle of the wind through the trees. I could also hear what sounded like the unmistakable crunch of boots on the gravel driveway that went up to the side of the house. I tried to listen harder, then there was a loud gong sound of something solid coming into contact with the metal railing that leads up to the back door. This makes me sit up all wide-eyed while my heart rate starts to increase. Maybe it was a wallaby or a possum. I just sit there as still as possible, just listening. I can hear the sound of trees in the wind and nothing else for a few moments, and I start to calm down. This is then interrupted by the pop and squeak of the back door being pushed open. Crap! I freeze, not knowing what to do. I could hear footsteps creaking through the back of the house, and I hear the laundry cupboard being opened. I was up the other end of the hallway, but I could hear whispering. The only words I could make out were, There, shh, be quick. I pull myself together and pull out my phone and call the police. I chat to the dispatcher while burying my head under the pillow to muffle my voice. I explain the situation to the dispatcher and she tells me that the police are on their way. While this is happening, I can hear a chink sound of what I'm assuming was the lock of the toolbox trying to be broken. The dispatcher suggests that I lock the door of the room I'm in. I agree, and as I slowly pad over across the room to the door, one of the floorboards then creaks so freaking loudly. I freeze, and I hear dead silence from the laundry. Crap. They must have heard. After about 30 seconds of standing still, I try to take another step and get yet another high-pitched creak. But this seems to work in my favor because I can hear my new house guests scatter away out the back door. I lock the bedroom door and tell the dispatcher that I think they're gone now. She tells me to stay put until the police arrive and I then tell her I'm more than happy to comply. After about five minutes, the cops arrive and the dispatcher then bids me farewell. The police did a search of the area and they didn't find anything, as expected. They had tried to break open the toolbox. One of the cops says, Why didn't they just use bolt cutters? Freaking amateurs. And we kind of all have a little laugh about it. I explained to the police about how when I came home, some of the tools that I left laying around were stolen, and that the toolbox looked like it had already been attempted to be broken into. Upon hearing that, the other cop stated his theory of how events took place. They probably broke in earlier tonight before you got here. They grabbed what they could, tried to open the toolbox but couldn't, and then left to go get something to open it with. While they were gone, you came home, and then they arrived back here to open the toolbox. I doubt they were dangerous, probably just kids, but who knows. Good timing, I think to myself. I then make a report and that's that. I stayed up until sunrise and then decided to get a couple of hours of sleep until my friend's wife could come pick me up to collect my car. I also ask if I can keep my tools at their place for safekeeping, to which they agree. I drove down to my dad's nursing home and had Christmas lunch with him and his new elderly buddies. The following day, I decided to go to a hardware store and purchase some newer, sturdier door locks. Hopefully this kind of thing doesn't happen ever again, and especially around Christmas. This happened about a month ago. I'm doing much better now, and for my future jobs, I will never take night shifts, as the dark alone gives me the creeps. I've applied for many jobs because I'm the legal age for working, 
as I'm in high school. I'm in desperate need of money, and I need to help my family out as well. So, at this point, I would take any job I can get. Five jobs accepted me, so I decided to do a trial at my first job that was pretty quick enough to accept, which happened to be McDonald's. I need to say that the staff and the manager were all very nice, and my friend also works there, which was a total bonus. The only really downfall working there was probably the customers, which my friend agreed, but anyway. I didn't really know what to pick for the shifts, or even if I wanted the job, so I asked for a practice shift. My manager happily agreed and let me choose my times. Instead of daytime shift, I chose the night, which was a very bad decision, but hey, I needed to see what it was like working there anyway, so this will be easy since it's night, right? Well, I was terribly wrong. I got ready in my friend's uniform that she let me borrow, and she even drove me there. I'll be honest, the McDonald's was rather sketchy. When I say sketchy, I mean there's so many alcoholics and druggies around, and upon arrival it just didn't feel right. During the car ride, I had a gut feeling that it wasn't going to be a good shift, but my friend kept reassuring me that all will be fine. She dropped me off at the bus stop, which was five minutes from my workplace, and said that she would pick me up at 12 a.m. It was around 10 p.m., so my practice shift lasts for about two hours. I agreed and said for her to pick me up at the same spot that she dropped me off at. As she sped off, I merely watched as her car shrunk into the distance. After I saw it was gone, I started walking towards McDonald's, but while walking, I began to hurt footsteps behind me. I didn't really think much of it because it was a normal thing. The person was probably just walking to their car or McDonald's or even the shops, but I had a really bad feeling. I felt like I was almost being watched, and I stopped for a second. The footsteps stopped with mine, and I looked behind to see a guy around his mid-40s just eyeing me off. I got really weirded out as he just smiled at me and then breathed very heavily. He was taller than me and he looked rather stronger and bigger than me as well. He was around what looked to be a few meters away. I quickly looked away and ran off to my workplace. There was only about three people working, my manager and my male friend. It was about 10.30 p.m. and I had already had a share of drunken rude people filling the orders up or even tried hitting on me. But he quickly left and shortly afterwards my friend showed up and helped me. He helped me out with most things, and I felt rather safe with him. He was actually an acquaintance of mine, but we soon grew to be best friends. After I was done taking some drunk guy's order, my friend pulled me aside and asked if I knew the guy outside. I was kind of confused at what he meant, and at first I thought he was just joking around. That is, until he pointed at the right window. My mouth went dry, and my face completely dropped. It was the same creepy guy that was following me before work, but I didn't tell him that. Instead, because I was an idiot, I kinda just laughed a bit and said that it was no big deal. He shrugged it off and we went back into the kitchen. It hit 11pm. No more customers were present and the same guy would not stop staring at me. At that point, I kind of just held my head down and just begged, hoping that he wouldn't come in. I could just feel his beady eyes run up and down my body. It was gross. It made me feel dirty. He's been there ever since the start of my shift and has been there for about 30 minutes, making it 10.30 now. I started to panic a bit as I was absolutely begging for him to not come in. In the middle of my thoughts, I heard something. My heart absolutely stopped as I then heard the sound of the door being opened. The creepy guy slowly walked towards my counter, eyeing my whole body until he was right in front of me, heavily breathing and almost drooling. His breath reeked like alcohol and cigarettes. He had a musky scent that, to be honest, nearly made me vomit. Red flags were totally going off, but I just tried to continue with my nice act. He wouldn't stop staring at me. I glanced at my friend who was in the kitchen. He was pretty busy, basically making sure nothing was getting burned. I turned my attention back to the guy and, no matter what I asked him, 
He was silent. It probably went on like that for about five minutes straight. That is, until he finally said something. Such beautiful skin. So young. Short black hair. Such a nice complexion you have. Before I could even speak or try and call someone over, something I wasn't prepared for then happened. The old guy launched towards me and tried entering the counterpart, which happened to be the same part I was working at. He then looked at me like I was a piece of meat. Trying to climb over the counter wasn't easy for him though, eventually trying to grab me and getting stuck midway as I tried backing up. To my luck, I then slipped and totally landed on my butt. I tried my best crawling away, hoping that he wouldn't pass through. I was of course rather startled and afraid to the point that I couldn't even utter a single word. My friend dropped what he was doing as he screamed for my manager to then come over. My manager quickly showed up, which then made the old guy get back up and then flee. My friend quickly ran to my aid and he took me to the back room, which is what my manager told him to do in order to calm me down. Shortly after, we called the cops. I glanced at my friend as he looked pretty pale and rather puzzled, like he saw a ghost. My manager waited at the counter for the cops. That's when my friend quickly explained who the guy was. As it turns out, the guy was known for creeping on the female staff members while they worked. He would take pictures, ask for their number, offer alcohol, and even documented what they looked like. He was actually already banned from even entering the place or even being near it. The cops were already very aware of who he was due to his creepy behavior in the past. After the whole investigation and getting questioned, it was about 1am and I was let go. My friend was with my other friend while I got questioned, and on my way home, my friend held my hand and kept reassuring me that everything will be fine. Safe to say, I don't think I'll ever go back there again, and after this, I don't think I trust any night shifts. I think I'm going to work at a different fast food place as well. So to that creepy old guy who's hopefully in jail, please stay away from me. So a bit of backstory before I begin. This happened in the summer of 2016 and I was currently spending a couple nights alone at home while my parents were away on a trip. I don't live in the nicest of cities, but I live in a relatively nice neighborhood since it's right next to a major university. I've been followed home a couple of times, had neighbors have their homes broken into and the like, but most of the really bad stuff happens in the downtown area of my city. Anyways, so it was late at night and one of my second nights home alone. It was around 11 p.m. I had been playing some video games with a couple of buddies of mine when I decided to go downstairs and make a late night snack. Cliche setting I know, but let's continue. When you walk down my stairs you make a 180 degree turn to walk down a short hallway that opens into my kitchen and living room. When you open the door from the hallway into the kitchen, across from the kitchen table is a set of doors that opens into the backyard. The two doors have giant windows that cover the whole door, kind of like a storm door I guess. Those will become relevant later. As I go into the kitchen and start making some ice cream, I thought I heard what sounded like laughing. Now at first I thought it was just my phone, since I had happened to be listening to a scary story podcast at the time. However, as I paused my podcast and waited a second, the laugh came yet again. The sound was… odd. The best way to describe the laugh is if you took the Star Wars character Yoda and made it a little bit creepier. It was childlike and playful yet so deep and sadistic. The laugh repeated again for a third time now, this time a little bit louder. I began to look around, wondering if it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I walked over to the sink where one of the windows that looks out to my backyard was, and all I saw was darkness. There didn't seem to be anything there, but right as I was about to look away, there was a face that appeared at my window. I immediately jumped back and then gasped. The face got closer to the window, and I could now see that it was a man. 
He had a giant cartoonish smile on his face. He then let out another one of those laughs and walked towards the two screen doors next to the sink. He began trying to jiggle the lock, all while laughing and then tapping at the window. I bolted upstairs, locking myself in my room with my bow staff in one hand and my phone in the other. Right as the operator picked up the phone, I heard glass then shatter downstairs, and then I heard that laugh again. That terrible, creepy laugh echo throughout the house. I trembled and stuttered as I told the operator my situation. She told me to calm down and that an officer would be there very soon. As I put the phone away from my ear just for a second, I noticed that it was now silent. I just stood there, the wooden floorboards now creaking as my weight shifted. Then I heard it. That dang laugh. It was pretty quiet at first, but then it got louder. I could hear the man walking up my stairs, the floorboards creaking louder with each step. It got louder and louder, and before I could realize what was happening, he was now at my door. I stayed completely silent, ready for him to come in. He tried the door. The lock jiggled. He began to laugh even more as he started to bound on the door. The bounding got louder as he began to throw himself into the door, the latches now starting to give away. That's when I saw it. The flashing lights. The man let up on the door and he just started laughing that terrible creepy laugh once more. He laughed when the police got upstairs. He laughed as they took him outside. And I swear to God I could hear him laugh as he got into the car. The rest of the story is pretty much a blur. My parents came home early and we got the place fixed up and the guy was convicted of breaking and entering. I'm almost 18 years old now and now it's just another story to scare my friends. But still, that's probably the creepiest thing that ever happened to me while home alone. Sometimes I just laugh about it. Other times, it still gives me the creeps. Be careful. So here's some backstory in order to understand everything. This guy who we'll call S was a friend of my dad's for years. I say it like that because I'm talking 25 to 30 years, not 3 or 4. He had lived with us various times throughout the first 15 years of my life. Also, my mom's side of the family throws a Christmas party every year on Christmas Eve. It's nothing big, just dinner, adults chatting, and sometimes a few presents for the younger kids. Now for the rest of the story. I'm around 9 years old when this part of the story takes place. We decided to go to the party. We lived easily 2 hours away, so we didn't go every year. This year was one of the many times that S had lived with us, so he came. Everything was fine and normal. S had a girlfriend we had met and said that he had invited her over and that she was on her way, but he was going to wait outside to make sure she found the right house and asked if I would wait with him. Thank God my mom overheard and said that it was too cold for me to go outside with him, especially due to the fact that I was wearing a dress. He went outside by himself. She never came. During all of this happening, one of my aunts had this pair of boots that she no longer wore and then gave them to me. Now, these weren't like stripper boots. They were brown with large clunky heels and only about two inches above my ankle. My dad is very overbearing and protective and, well, the list goes on. He didn't really like these boots and thought I was way too young to be wearing them. We're getting ready to leave and I'm climbing into the very back of the car while S holds the seat down. After I sit down, he looks straight at me and then says like a freaking deranged child, I like your boobies, and then makes a squishy motion with his hands just a few feet away from me. I cried the whole way home. That night after we got home, we got settled in and my younger siblings went to bed. My mom had me come out and help her finish getting ready for the next day. She had me eat the cookies and drink the milk. While I was doing this, I lose my crap and start bawling my eyes out. My mom obviously notices and asked me what's up. I told her all about S and what he had said to me. 
She asked me if he could have meant the boots, and then I explained about the hand motions he made to me. She totally flips and then tells my dad, and I retell the whole story to him. A few days later, S moved back in with his mom. Fast forward a few years. I'm now 14 to 15 years old. He was in a lot of trouble and he asked my dad if he could move back in with us. He told my dad that he was drunk that night and he didn't mean what he said, and let it just be in the past. So my dad let him. Now, he lived with us for a very short period of time. I'm talking maybe a year. During this time, I was very close to this dog that we owned. His name was Scooby. This is relevant to the story. Now, Scooby was my baby. He followed me, slept with me every night, and if I went to a friend's house overnight, he was lost. He also never let anyone into my room. He would always growl if anyone got near my bedroom door that he wasn't okay with. Now, Scooby did not like S by any means. For example, one day I was hanging clothes and Scooby of course was laying down by my ankles. He noticed S by the door and then ran over jumping on the door, barking, snarling, growling, and lunging at the door. My mom thought Scooby was going to break through the glass in order to attack this man. S would try to make conversation with me and, depending on the day, would depend on how friendly I was. I was a pretty moody teen. If I was the slightest bit sassy and my parents weren't around, he'd get angry and then yell at me. He one time threw a pencil at me and told me to watch how I talked to him. One night though, a friend of mine was staying over. She was allergic to cats and I had to make sure that I vacuumed my room, wiping everything off and washing all of my bedding. We ended up going to sleep and then woke up the next morning. I woke up before her and I reached behind my knees to pet Scooby, but he wasn't laying there. I look over and he's curled up in the corner, absolutely scared. I call him over and cuddle him for a little while because he's obviously very scared about something. I then look around trying to figure out what happened. Soon enough, I notice clothespins on my desk. Now, I know dang well that they were not there the night before. I specifically remember because I had to clean my room so thoroughly. I went to go ask my mom, and I noticed that his clothes are hanging outside. I told my mom, my dad, and my grandma. The only one who believed me was my mom. A few months later, S actually stole my 12-year-old little brother's wallet, and over $100 that my brother had just gotten for his birthday and he took off with it. So to S the pervert, you are a total piece of crap. This happened in the summer of 2010, when I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take the trip, but I remember a lot of family friends coming with us and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents, and it's not really important to the story. To preface, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat and have always been one. I'm a pretty skinny, fragile kid, so I get spooked pretty easily, even now. This however, was almost definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally did. Looking back, I'm incredibly lucky I trusted my instincts. This hotel had a really strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor, not the bottom floor, which I found pretty strange. To access the lobby, you had to use the elevator. There was no way for you to get to it from the stairs. This information would have been nice before everything happened, as you'll find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony, and you could look down into the lobby and cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you're walking to your room, you could be seen from anyone that was on your floor if they just stepped out of the room and looked around. I was always afraid I'd fall over the balcony and then sail eight stories to my death, but they were high enough to a point where I wasn't really concerned for my safety. The first day or two was pretty nice. My friends and I hung out and played cards all day long, or we watched whatever was on TV. At night, we'd explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. It was a really fun time, even though I didn't fully understand why we were there to begin with. On the third day though, 
things got pretty strange really fast. I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside my door. Now, because of the hotel's design, which I mentioned earlier, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way up to the top of the building. So, when I walked outside to investigate, I immediately looked over to the balcony to see what the commotion was about. I saw a girl laying on the ground with eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her, and I heard a couple of people telling each other to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious. Maybe she had passed out or something. I don't know. I scanned the lobby and saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby getting breakfast, all just staring at the event in front of them. I decided I'd rush down to meet them to find out what the heck happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of my door, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take about 4 flights down. No big deal. I then descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall, or the letter L. I passed floor 5, ready to find a door to the lobby. I took about two more flights of steps before realizing that there hadn't been a door for the fourth, nor had there been a door for the third or second. Now this is the point where I probably should have turned back, but I decided to continue down because I was really tired and I didn't want to climb back up. There were some really weird side hallways that went into pitch black areas with a bunch of piping and wiring, and though I was really curious to explore, I passed them by. I quickly hit the bottom floor. A dimly lit and cold room with cinder block walls and concrete floors. Right in front of me was a set of double doors. I kind of hesitated at first, but I assumed that this was just another way back to the lobby, so I decided to open them and then entered. Behind those doors was a massive warehouse type room, probably the size of a smaller basketball stadium. The only light that was coming in was from the stairwell right behind me so I wasn't really able to see much. Stairs were stacked and covered in plastic wrap, tables lined the wall, and in the distance I thought I could see boxes stacked and lined against the wall as well. I was probably in the storage room for the hotel. I then looked around and saw that there was an elevator in the back of the room, so I made my way towards it. I closed the door to the stairwell and began to walk in the dim light. The room was super muggy and dusty, and it seemed like nobody had been down there in a really long time. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed that it was a little bit bigger than the elevators in the lobby and the other floors. I pressed the up button, but got no response. There was also a card swiper next to the button. Huh, must just be for employees, I thought to myself. I turned back towards the stairwell doors making my way past the chairs and tables along the wall. When I got to the door, I gave it a tug. Locked. Of course. Now, this is when things started to really hit me, and I realized I was stuck in the dark, dusty basement of a hotel. I didn't have a phone because my parents wouldn't let me get one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't really call anyone. Everyone likely assumed I was still asleep in the room, so I began to freak out, believing that nobody was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse looking for other ways out. Some of the areas of the place were better lit than others, so I looked around in areas that I could see first before starting on the darker side of the room. There was one other set of doors that I found, but it also happened to be locked as well. I began to cry, scared that nobody would ever find me in this basement. I swear it felt like hours. But I think only a handful of minutes passed before I heard the door creak open. It wasn't the door from the stairwell, rather the second door that I had found. A slim middle-aged man in a lab coat came out of the doors. Now, if this was 21-year-old me seeing this man, I would be very confused as to why this guy was wearing a lab coat in a hotel. But I was only 12 or 13 at the time, so I immediately was very relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. I then approached him, tears in my eyes, and he immediately looked very surprised to see me, as you'd expect. What are you doing down here? He yelled. I got lost on my way down to the lobby, and I've been locked in here. Do you have a key? I was shaking, eager to get the heck out of there. He didn't really answer my key question, 
And instead, he said to me, I know a way out of here. Follow me. He began to walk towards the doors with the stairwell, and I followed, now relieved that someone had finally come to save me. We approached the doors and I began to reach for the handle, but he continued walking. Isn't it right here? I asked him. I will never forget the look on his face when I said that. He looked nervous and though it was dim, I could clearly see sweat glistening from his forehead and behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, but I was now nervous myself. We passed the door to the stairs and we were now headed towards a darker side of the basement, away from the elevators. He looked like he had no clue where he was leading me as he kept checking around him, almost as if he was taking in his surroundings for the very first time. We turned a corner and began walking towards the boxes. A dead end. I immediately froze, now realizing that something was very, very wrong here. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. I then said, my voice shaking, Um, where are we going? He turned and then said, This way, just follow me. I knew that there were no doors by those boxes. I had checked to there first after I found out the stairwell door was locked. I really want to thank whatever god is up there for gifting me with the idea that I had next. I started yelling as loud as I could. I yelled so loud that I actually gave myself a headache. The man irritated and plugging his ears began yelling back at me. What are you doing? Be quiet! I continued to just yell. I don't even remember how long I was yelling for. Finally the man snapped and began quickly walking towards me. I went in full sprint towards the stairwell doors, hoping to god they'd somehow be magically open. The man didn't run after me, but he walked sternly behind me, muttering things like, Stupid kid! and other kind compliments. I was about five feet from the door when somebody burst through. My savior. It was a hotel janitor who had heard the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation. Me a child, and some random guy in a lab coat in a locked basement, and immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who the man was, and I said I had no idea. That he'd come through the door on the other side of the room, and I then pointed to the door. The janitor quickly radioed into the desk that he had found a child in the basement, and quietly so that I wouldn't hear, he then said, This man came from outside. Get security. The man in the lab coat started trying to argue with the janitor, claiming that he was simply just looking for a bathroom. The janitor clearly wasn't buying it and kept saying things like, Wait until security gets here and talk to them about it. I was standing beside him the whole time, trying to take in what was happening, totally confused out of my mind. Eventually, an employee from the front desk finally arrived and took me back up the steps to the lobby, where I then met with my family who surprisingly had no idea that I was even missing in the first place. I told them the story while crying and shaking. They began hugging me so tightly, thanking the hotel employees over and over for their help. I never got to thank that janitor though. Looking back now, I have absolutely no clue what that man was doing in the basement. I don't have any information as to what happened afterwards or who he was. I know for a fact though that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated. Something about low blood sugar. Not really sure. I've thought about that day a lot. And the only explanation that I can put together is that the door that I had found in the basement led to the streets of the city, where he must have wandered in from. I have no idea what his intentions were, why he was wearing a lab coat, or why he chose to pretend to know a way out. To be frank, this could have just been a huge misunderstanding of some sort, and I just really chose a bad time to get lost. But all I know for sure is if I hadn't screamed my lungs out, I might not have been telling the story the same way or at all. So, to that strange man in a lab coat, wandering around a dark, dusty hotel basement, I really hope I never encounter you ever again. This happened in the very early 90s, and as we all know, it was a very different world those days, and for a kid, I was pretty naive. 
I also had kind of a messed up childhood, so this wasn't the worst things to happen by far. And therefore, I pretty much just brushed it off. When I was around 11 or 12 years old, I would visit the boys club a lot. My parents thought that sending me to the boys club camp for the summer only made sense. The camp wasn't an overnight type deal, but featured all of the normal things that you would expect, like a lake, arts, crafts area, and crappy school style lunches. I did the normal camp things like found a girlfriend and getting into a lot of trouble. The camp was run by counselors which I can only assume were in their 20s to 30s. And as you would expect, they would always come up with very interesting punishments for kids. Like being forced to carry a huge wooden totem pole in circles in a hot field for quite some time. Or just straight up punching you in your chest and knocking the wind out of you. Which I did experience. One of the counselors that I had this experience with was named TJ. He was a very large, well-built guy in his 20s. One day I did something wrong and then I got sent to the lunch area for essentially detention. The area was large and was actually a large concrete floor with a wooden roof attached to a cabin that contained the kitchen. It was basically a school lunch setup where you would come and choose chocolate milk or orange juice and then get served a really crappy turkey sandwich, a pack of mayo, and one of those amazing brownies. When I get there, I notice that there's about four or five kids already sitting at benches, and I notice that TJ's in the front of everyone by the lunch serving area, pacing and saying something. I then sit down and I don't really remember what happened. That is, until things started to get weird. TJ pulled out a knife and got an apple. He started skinning and stabbing it and saying stuff like, This is what I'll do to you if you all get in trouble again. And other things of that nature. At this time, I honestly didn't feel scared in any way due to my tendency to completely shut down when crap gets bad. But I do remember feeling very creeped out and that he was trying way too hard to be threatening. All of the younger kids, especially a little girl who was maybe about 8 years old or so, was freaking out and crying. The next thing I remember is him telling her to follow him into the kitchen. And then I heard a lot of screaming and crying coming from the back of the kitchen. After a while, he came back with her and her face was totally streamed with tears. I remember it vividly. He then looked at me and another boy and told us to follow him as he escorted us to a huge walk-in refrigerator and then brought us inside. He then said, I want you both to start screaming and acting like I'm hurting you in here. If you don't make the other kids scared, I will hurt you for real. We did as he asked and when he closed the door, we both just started screaming and wailing. At this point, I honestly thought it was kind of funny because I rationalized that the little girl was probably just told the same thing. Anyway, after about 5 or 10 minutes, he let us out and told us to go back to our benches. Again, I don't really remember anything after this, just kind of a blank. I remember when I got home that night from... I remember when I got home that night from camp telling my mom about it, and I remember she called someone, and I think the guy got fired. I don't really remember ever seeing him again, and my parents never sent me back to that camp. I never really thought about it much growing up, but as the years have gone by, I look back to things that I shrugged off as normal, and I can now see that they were anything but that. Try not to be as gullible as I was. This weird older guy cat called me while I was shopping in town, and when I didn't respond, he started walking. He then started following me for an uncomfortably long time, so I made my way to my brother's friend's workplace and then explained what happened. He was gone by the time we went back outside to check, but he called my brother to pick me up anyway. I didn't really think much of it after that. Fast forward a couple of months and I get a call from someone claiming to be my sister's friend from university. He had claimed that she had given him a parcel for me and that he needed to meet with me right away at a secluded location because it was close to my house. This is something my sister had done three or four times previously. He knew my name, my sister's name, her friends, her university, my friends, and my high school. After the chats, I agreed to meet him at our local shops, where I was well known. 
It wasn't that far from where he had suggested, so he agreed. I made my way there, and then I froze when I saw him walking towards me. It was him, the same guy that had followed me around months earlier. He then said something along the lines of, Finding you was a piece of cake. And I didn't wait to find out what he meant. I went straight into the butchers and quickly told him what was going on. He was chased away by a knife-wielding butcher, and I never heard from him or saw him ever again. When my sister finally picked up the phone, she said that she had no such friend and didn't even know what I was talking about. It really took a lot of convincing to let my dad let me go anywhere after that happened. I try my best not to think about what his intentions were, but to this day, every time I think about it, it still gives me the creeps. My father worked in a machine shop across town which had its fair share of characters there. One of these people was named James. Now, James was one of those guys that would seem normal at first but had one heck of a temper. One minute you could be eating lunch, and then the next he would be trying to fight you over the smallest things. So, while my father was at work, James had come in absolutely drunk, which many of the guys had done before, but James could barely function let alone operate a mill. My father pulled him aside and told him he needed to leave, and that him coming in drunk could possibly get him or someone else hurt, which then leads to him getting mad and trying to fight my father. Now, James isn't a small guy. He's about six foot tall and around the larger side, while my father was only about five foot six. James had grabbed a metal pole and was swinging it around trying to hit my father with it. Thankfully, he didn't hit him, but he tore the heck out of a door before being restrained by the other workers and was then kicked out, being fired. My father ended up leaving work early, and he made his way to a friend's place to have a beer and calm his nerves. Later on in the day, eight-year-old me is home alone as my mother was at the store getting groceries. I was playing Halo 3 at the time, before hearing a knock at the door. I walked up to the door, and I see James through the window. Although I didn't know him well as I've only met him once, I knew him well enough to know that he wasn't a stranger. So, I opened the door. Hey, how are you? Is your father home? He had said in the nicest tone that he could muster, his breath smelling of alcohol. I had told him no, but somehow my eight-year-old self knew well enough to not say that I was home alone. My mom was in the shower. That was an absolute lie, and her truck wasn't even in the driveway, and it was pretty obvious I was home alone. He had then nodded, walking away from the door a little before I closed it, promptly locking it before going back to my game. A few minutes passed by, and my mother arrives home with a few groceries. Once they were brought inside, we had heard a bang at the door, then another, then another. This was not like a knock. Someone was literally banging on our door trying to get in. My mom had looked through the window before grabbing me in the phone and running into the bedroom closet which had a lock. I had no clue what was going on but I just knew it wasn't good. She had called 911 and had said there was a crazy man trying to break in. All the while the sound of the banging could be heard in the background. For what seemed like hours, we waited in the closet still hearing the loud bangs as he had started charging into the door with his shoulder, just screaming like a maniac. After about 15 minutes, we then heard the familiar sound of a police siren as we heard the confrontation right outside. It didn't take long for them to arrest the man. My mom stayed on the line with the 911 operator until we finally walked out now seeing James in cuffs in the very back of a patrol car. My father had rushed home and hugged us both, James staring at us with pure hatred in his eyes. Although it wasn't confirmed, I had a good feeling that he was after my dad, wanting to finish the job and beating him. He had seen my mother's truck thinking it was my father, as he would occasionally drive it to work every now and then. To the awful man who tried to break into our home, and to the man who tried to hurt my father. I really hope I never see you ever again. So, it's the summer of 2013, 
I'm 21 years old and just finished my junior year in college. The second week of August, a group of my friends and I go on an eight-day camping trip. It's about seven of us in total, four guys and three girls. We're camping in a semi-remote campground in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It was a large campground, but very few other campers were there. There were a few field sites near the front of the campground, but we purposely requested a site off in the back corner. We wanted to be completely by ourselves. During the trip, we planned a whitewater rafting trip for one of the days. We were hiking Mount Washington towards the end of the trip and thought maybe we'd do one to two other small hikes, with one to two days of just chilling by the lake at the campground. We also planned on doing plenty of drinking during the evenings. The first couple of days of the trip were fantastic. Whitewater rafting was a blast. Everything went great. So, it's the evening of our third day, and we're having a roaring fire going. We're all just hanging out at the campsite, just drinking and messing around. It's now around 9.30, when a disheveled looking man walks past our site. His clothes are kind of torn and worn out, and he had messy and tangled hair. He looks maybe in his mid-40s if I had to guess. This isn't weird though. We all just think that it's just another camper doing a late evening stroll around the campground. About an hour and a half later, we see this same man walk past our site in the same direction. This time, however, he's walking a little slower, almost with a bit of a limp. We're all pretty drunk at this point, and I'm not really sure, but I think one of us yelled something out to him. But he just ignores us and keeps on walking. Mildly strange, but still, probably just someone who wanted to take a really long walk. We wrap up the night at around 1.30 to 2 a.m. The fire is dying down and we head back to our tents. I usually really love sleeping while camping. I usually find it extremely peaceful, but for some reason, I was having some trouble getting some sleep this night. I get up and decide to take a pee in the woods. When I do, I then see a faint light maybe about 50 to 75 yards ahead of me in the woods. It kind of looks like a dim flashlight or something similar. I decide I want to investigate. I go back to the tents and one of my other buddies is still awake, so I decide to tell him about it. We get up to investigate and when we do, the light is no longer on. Feeling a little creeped out, I shine my flashlight around the woods a bit, but I don't see anything, so I decide that maybe my eyes were just playing a trick on me, and I decide to head back to bed. Sometime later that night, I wake up to a terrifying scream. It was my friend Sarah, one of the girls that we were camping with. I jump out of my tent as quickly as possible and nearly run into her as she's running back to our campsite. She's still screaming. She screams that there was a man standing in the middle of the woods. Now our entire group of people is now awake and everyone is freaking the heck out. I try to calm Sarah down enough to get her to explain what actually happened. She says that she went to pee in the woods and then saw the man from earlier just standing about 15 feet from her. Not moving, just standing there like a statue. We're all freaking out now, just yelling and screaming and just making a giant commotion. I'm internally freaking out as well, but try to calm everyone down enough so we can actually do something. We obviously decide to get the heck out of there. We frantically take down our tents, basically just ripping the poles out and throwing everything back into our cars. We then get into the car and speed the heck out of there. It's now around 4am and we're in two separate cars and we decide to just drive away from the campsite just to try and clear our heads. Eventually, at around 5.30, we find a small diner that's open and we decide to head in for some breakfast. We all have different theories about what the heck just happened. Some of us think we just ran into a homeless guy who was camping out in the woods and was surprised by us. Some of the girls think maybe he was stalking us. Either way, obviously none of us are comfortable staying at that campground again. I head back to the front desk of the campground with two of the other guys. We explain what happened and the guys at the front desk actually seemed to believe us, but they said there was definitely no other campers that fit the description of the guy.
They were insanely nice about it though, and they actually refunded most of the remainder of our stay, which really astonished me. As a group, we decided that screw it, we weren't going to let one freaky guy ruin our trip. We find another campground a good ways away to stay at. Fast forward two days and we're hiking Mount Washington. We get up really early and get to the mountain at around 7.30 to start hiking up. We're a little over halfway up the mountain when we then see the very same guy hiking down. We're all just frozen and a few of us let out a surprise scream. He just strolls right past us with this massive creepy grin plastered all over his face. Luckily there are enough hikers nearby that nothing could really happen. We decide to continue hiking up anyways since he's headed in the opposite direction and we're probably never going to encounter him again. We did finish the hike and luckily we didn't see him again. After that, we did decide to cut the trip a couple of days short. Looking back on it, we've all come to the conclusion that we were very likely being stalked in some way or another. If it really was just some homeless guy in the woods near the campground, what the heck is he doing hiking down Mount Washington a couple days later? It was definitely a creepy experience. My mom's identical twin could not be more opposite of her in every aspect, except for their identical appearance. My aunt is a free-spirited traveling woman who is now unmarried in her 60s who moves whenever she gets bored of her town. She was no different when she was young. She found herself hitchhiking when she was traveling in the United States. We're from Canada. She said that one night when she was trying to hitch a ride, a nice man then pulled over and offered her a ride. She said a nice man dressed very well got out of his car on the side of the road and then asked her if she would like a ride with him. Her immediate reaction was how handsome he was and that she actually fantasized about her and this man traveling the country together and him joining her lifestyle. He specifically asked her questions about her in an effort to make sure she wasn't some crazy person. She said that she appreciated this and his apprehension made him trustworthy. She got in the car and they rode for about five minutes before he then leaned over and locked her door, telling her it's jiggly and can fall open if unlocked. This made her immediately uncomfortable and she said that she decided that she wanted to get out. There was a couple other things that he said that she felt were off-putting, but I can't remember exactly what they were and I don't want to spread false info. She said that she hopped out at the next red light and he even tried to grab her as she ran out. A few years later, when Ted Bundy was finally caught, her, my mom, and my mom's then boyfriend were watching the broadcast on TV. My mom says that my aunt screamed when his face popped up on the TV because she recognized him as the man who picked her up years before. To this day, she swears up and down that she's 100% positive it was him. It's absolutely crazy to think what could have happened if she didn't follow her gut instinct. Okay, so I'm a 29 year old female. I switched up my career in healthcare to follow my dream of learning to work on cars. I was hired this past May at a dealership as a quick service mechanic and fell in love immediately with everything about it and my coworkers. I had kind of noticed just how cute my trainer was. Not only was he cute, but he was very patient with training me. I was so new to working on cars and I needed to learn the basics and he was just so cute and nice about everything. I'll call him Nick. Nick was about 40. Me and Nick had really hit it off in every way possible. He asked me on our first date to go geocaching. Well, Nick and I have been side by side ever since. I really loved everyone I worked with, always laughing and playing pranks on one another, but also always helping each other and busting our butts to always make the customers happy. I should add that my best friend also works there as well, and another good friend of ours had also gotten hired. We were a close-knit family in the quick service department. Well, I didn't make it past my probationary period because I was just a bit slower. 
So Nick has a full mechanic garage at his dad's place and I'd meet him after work and we'd go make some side money. So about a month ago, Nick and I decided to get an apartment together and it's been amazing. I've been bringing him to work, grabbing him on lunch break, and picking him up, which I absolutely love because I can also say hey to all of my old co-workers. That being said, I should also add that Nick doesn't have any social media, and we're together literally all the time, except when he's working. Here's where things get crazy. I get a message request on Facebook from some random girl saying, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Nick is my man and he's in your profile photo with you. He's been my man for seven months. Now I immediately go into panic mode. I call him at work asking who this girl is and he was just as confused as I was. The more I talked to this girl to try and figure out what the heck's going on, the more she said weirdly specific things about Nick. Like the truck he drives, they made up at his dad's shop, and she knew his phone number and everything but she could never provide proof or a screenshot of conversations or any photos of them two together. Nothing. We got to a point where it felt like this whole thing was real and that her and I were going to team up, but she never answered any of my calls, only messages. After Nick and I had a huge talk about it, I just knew that something wasn't right about this girl, and I had to get to the bottom of it. I started getting pretty freaking scared when one day I dropped Nick off after lunch. A minute went by and I get a weird message saying, Dang, Nick looks really sexy in that hoodie today. Now this totally shook me up. I asked what color and she said the correct color. At this point my first thought is this stalker is like actually watching us. I then told Nick about how she knew what he was wearing and he was super creeped out. Then when I went to pick him up, I usually park by the quiet side of the building where no one can actually see me. This time though, a work truck drives by me very slowly. I pretend to not notice him because I was in no mood to chat with anyone, and I recognized the driver as a former co-worker of mine that I'd only spoke to maybe about two times during my time at the dealership. However, we happened to be friends on Facebook. Within about a minute of him passing me by, the girlfriend then messages me saying, You're waiting for Nick on the side of the building right now. I see you. In that moment, I just started freaking out. This dude is pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. Then after talking to Nick about it, it turns out he was the only one from work that knew about Nick's dad having a shop. Nick had actually worked on this guy's truck before. They aren't really friends, but just kind of chat here and there. Well, not anymore, but I just don't know why he was saying such gross things to me and why he was pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. If he's capable of doing this, who the heck knows what else he's capable of. He's also a giant dude in his 40s with children of his own. I see this dude every day and Nick still works with him. He's in a different department than Nick, so thank God for that. So yeah, I'm still not sure what to do about this. But crazy former co-worker pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend to get us to break up or something. I really wish I didn't have to meet you again, even though I know I'll be seeing you at work tomorrow. You really need to stay away from Nick and I. There was this one time where this guy that I matched with on Tinder drove like two hours to come see me at my job. I had no idea that he was even showing up. I had walked back from the storage room and there he was, just there. He pulled up my profile and then said, It's me. Very nice to finally meet you. Now, I have no problem meeting new people that I've talked to before. But uh, yeah, this was a game changer. I warmed up into talking to him and we sat down at the booth. I made it pretty obvious that I didn't want him sitting right beside me but he scooted me over and then started touching me. At this point, I was just over it. Closing time had came around and he wanted me to walk him to his jeep. As I was walking away, he then grabbed my hand and started kissing me. Not like the enjoyable magical kiss, but like I need this to be over kind of kiss. He started biting my tongue and then squeezing my sides. I've never felt so violated in my life. 
From that point on, I never told anybody that I met online where I work unless I knew it was going somewhere. To this day, I still can't believe that that creep showed up to my work. I definitely hope nothing like that happens again. This happened a few years ago. I was living alone in a large city where I didn't really know that many people. At the time, I was seeing someone and had just dropped him off at the metro station. It was around 2 in the afternoon, so still lots of people around and very sunny. I had no real reason to feel weary. I went into the metro line that I had to take to get home and just sat on the bench. There was one other guy sitting there, and when I sat down, he just started looking at me. I assumed he just looked out of curiosity, but we made eye contact. I smiled and said hi and, instantly, I just knew it was a mistake. He smiled back and then said hi and for a moment, I thought I was just overreacting. We both sat down into the metro car and then he sat down across from me. I thought it was no big deal and eventually it seemed like he ran into someone he knew as they were chatting for a bit. Eventually his friend got up and left and that's when it started. Every time I looked up at him, he was just staring at me, smiling. He said hi to me after about the third or fourth time that this happened. My heart sank. Eventually I saw my stop coming up. I would have to change lines here, so I was really hoping I could get away from him. I then got up and waited near the door. He also got up and waited behind me. I was wearing a skirt and in the reflection of the metro car window, I could see him very slowly rake his eyes up my legs. As soon as the door opened, I walked quickly right out of it. He followed. I decided to see if he was really following me, so I started walking towards one end of the platform where there was an exit. He walked the same way. There were some people in between us, so I didn't really think he would try anything. I suddenly swerved and walked towards another exit. He followed me yet again. I did this two or three more times and he was going the same way every single time. I started to panic now and I really wasn't sure what to do. In a big city like that, people are just looking to go on their way as quickly as possible. So I didn't really feel confident in stopping someone and asking for help. I didn't think I could lose him so easily by walking around. I saw that the hallway to the line that I needed to take was pretty crowded, and I decided to take my chances and try to lose him there. He was quickly in pursuit. Now, I'm pretty small, so I was able to weave through the crowd faster than he was, but he quickly caught up to me anyways. At one point, he had actually cornered me in the hallway. Hi, how are you? He asked, with a friendly smile still on his face. It terrified me. Here he was stalking me in broad daylight and he was so serene about it. It was extremely unsettling. I looked around. There were so many people but they were all in a hurry to reach the metro. I saw to my right that there was a staircase to a metro platform. That's when I decided to try and make a break for it. With no warning, I sprinted off. He seemed caught off guard because he didn't really follow me right away. I was so lucky that he didn't. By the time he started chasing me, there were way too many people for him to pass to catch up. I was in a total panic though and still ran like my life depended on it. I practically flew down the stairs and into a metro car that had just pulled in. When the doors closed behind me, I just saw him standing at the top of the stairs, just looking at me. Some people in the metro car seemed unsettled by just how scared I looked and kept glancing at me but no one said anything. I kind of just stood there shaking for a couple of stops. Eventually, I looked to see where I was and it turned out that I'd caught the line home after all. It didn't really make me feel any safer though. So, to that really weird metro guy who was straight up stalking me in broad daylight, I can only hope that I don't encounter you ever again at the metro.